Carl, you had uh, you had three. I don't have my phone with me. You had three requests. I know you wrote them down. Somebody, how, just send the email to anyone. Everyone. 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 Okay. So I know it's Pastoral Search and Jones. Jones. Brother. One other I can't think of. Larry and Amy. Larry and Amy. Larry and Amy. So we have microphones, so if you're going to share something, grab a mic so uh, our online folks can hear you. I just want to give you a quick update. We've been praying for my friend Dina to have um, wisdom about what they're going to do um, with their daughter for the fall, what school she's going to go to. And they did make a decision. And she said she was at the conference that Cynthia did, and they were talking about giving something to the Lord. And this was some this decision was something that she felt like she handed over to the Lord. And she's been talking the whole time. She was trying to make this decision about how God needed to give her this huge sign, like she needed something bright and neon, and it just wasn't happening. And we had talked to her about, you know, sometimes God's voice isn't like that. Sometimes it's not this huge flashing light thing that she was waiting for. And she kind of was feeling like, well, God's not answering me then. If if I don't have this big thing. And she was talking yesterday, kind of in the middle of giving Michael some grief about the preaching today. <laughs> um, and she just, she was like, well, why don't you tell them that I thought that God needed to give me a great big sign, that I, but that I've learned that God's voice isn't always the voice that I'm expecting, but that we have made this decision about um, Delaney through a number of different situations that they went through meetings they had with the schools, but they really feel at peace about their decision, and she feels like she's heard from the Lord on what is good for her daughter, but that it wasn't the way she expected. Thank you for praying for her. Sorry, I have one on this list my phone. Um, boy, is it dry. <laughs> um, I want to thank the Lord for the past two weeks that we've had um, traveling for my work. <clears throat> we have been in uh, Utah, Montana, Colorado, um, I, yeah, Idaho by accident, and, um, and uh, Missouri, and probably 11 flights in uh, the past two weeks, and I don't know how many rental cars, and it's been crazy. But we've seen um, the Lord in so many ways. Um, the first <clears throat> sign, and it was really great that Bob was able to come along with me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, we got on the plane, and we had a stop in Chicago on the way to Salt Lake. And um, Bob leans over and he says to me, boy, that guy looks a lot like Burt Plaster. <laughs> it was Burt Plaster <laughs> on the same plane. So um, after we took off and after the um, the uh, seatbelt light went off, Bert like ran up the aisle and jumped in the middle seat between us, and we had coffee and fellowship together and catching up with family, and it was just such a blessing to have that experience. Um, God had planned it. Um, Bert didn't know he was flying until a short time before that, and so it's just really cool. <clears throat> then. Um, we also had um, an opportunity to see some scenery that had Bob and I, well, we had never planned on going west to see some sites, but um, thankfully for this work trip, I was able to see some things that were just amazing to me. Um, so one night when we were in Montana, <clears throat> Bob and I both probably have not had a nightmare in years. And we both had two nightmares um, in that hotel. Um, very strange. And for me, it was about that a child had been trafficked. Very strange, not on my, not on my thoughts, not on anything <clears throat> that I was even thinking about. I am always aware in hotel rooms that um, things could happen. Um, and we're always supposed to take a picture of a hotel room as a meeting planner just in case um, somebody can recognize a scene um, in, a, in a video or something. But anyway, um, it was really strange for me to have two of those dreams. So the next morning, um, 
we were going to go to breakfast, and Bob found a wig on the floor of the hotel room, which is very strange. Hadn't seen it the night before. We reported it, and they were like, you know, whatever, housekeeping didn't pick it up. But when you have two dreams about human trafficking, and then find something like that, it's pretty significant. So um, they finally called us back after a week, and I tried to email them several times. And every time I emailed them, both from my company address and my personal address, they all came back. Um, there's no such address for the hotel. That was for the general manager and three or four other people that I had put on the email. So it's very strange. I did report it to the hotel chain, and uh, we'll see what will happen. But of course, they denied that there would be anything untoward going in there, but we just thought it was a strange occurrence. Um, <clears throat> then we got to see, we finally made it to Gateway, Colorado, which is on the Utah border, and we got to greet one of Cynthia's dearest friends, Beverly, who works at the hotel that we were visiting. Um, by the way, we'll, I'm going to post pictures later, but we did not stay in all these fancy hotels we visited them, <laughs> uh, except for this one. But it was great to see Beverly, and um, Bob and I both were able to give our testimony to two attendants at the, um, at the hotel, which um, for me, I don't know what happened to Bob, but my um, attendant uh, was crying when I told him about my healing and um, from lupus. So it was, yeah, and then our driver on the way home, he was a believer and we shared some fellowship. But very thankful for the trip, very thankful for the way the Lord showed up in different places for us. And um, we'll see what will happen as far as my company is concerned where we end up. But I'm just very thankful for this time away and for um, people that took over different spots that we have here. And uh, thankful to be back in fellowship with you all. And I hope my voice comes back. Because it, it wasn't lost until just I wanted to give a testimony. <laughs> Anybody else grab a mic in? I just. <clears throat> The painter showed up on Wednesday, painted the front door, and so did Rachel and four of their children, so did Karen, so did three of my grandsons. So we had some help, we had some work done, and uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of days where we can get back here and do some more work. But uh, we did have people come, and we, if you walk into the pastor's office right now, you can see the floor. So. That's a good thing. So I thank Karen for that and the girls and uh, we replaced some ceiling tiles and the painter painted the doors. So it was a good day. Excellent. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. Um, also a reminder that we are responsible for providing the food for Kensington the first Saturday in August. I believe it's the 6th. So if you can help with the food or utensils, napkins, that kind of stuff. I know Jenny sent out an email to all the church. Or if you want to go as a volunteer to help serve, you could use volunteers. So just to remember that. So oftentimes he sleeps uh, sitting on a chair because sitting on a bed makes it worse and not that sitting on a chair you know, gets rid of any of his acid reflux problem, but he probably only gets about two, three hours of sleep a day. And well, you can take a nap throughout the day, but you know, he needs prayer to help maintain his weight. He's about six foot tall and weighs about 100 pounds. So kind of thing. Where's the second mic anyway? I just want to know. Just keep helping drop that there. <laughs> Don't stick it in your pocket, Lou. Anywhere in church? 
So if you guys could pray for uh, my brother, who's about to have his uh, first kid, I guess, sometime in the next month. I mean, I'd be on like, one of the natural births inside their apartment, so we pray that everything goes well and smooth. Their baby's name is going to be called Mercury. <laughs> Okay, then let me uh, let me pray for these things. Lord, well, we thank you for a chance to get together as the body of Christ here in Willow Grove. And, uh, Lord, we, we think of the, the impact the church can have on our community, Lord, and we look to you for guidelines and um, actions uh, in the spirit and also in the physical that we can do. We thank you for our garden and the, the opportunity to uh, reach out with that for people coming by uh, getting some good insights for so we thank you too for our pastoral search pray for the board on this week during our meeting we'll be discussing some of the details about uh what we'd like to see questions we'd like to ask our candidates so help us have wisdom in that regard we absolutely pray for pray for Jung's brother lord it's been a long time and we've been praying at the men's prayer for him just to give, give, give him a a turnaround, Lord. It doesn't seem like much is going on except uh, bad stuff. So we pray for him and his health, that he'd be able to retain food, that he'd be able to put on weight, and uh, just for his general health, Lord, and for the concerns the family has for him. Uh, thank you also for Larry and Adriana and the, the ongoing story of their visa and passports or whatever they need to travel. And um, just pray you work in the people that... Uh, that are all responsible for that. We're completely dependent on them and dependent on you, Lord, for these kind of things and ask that you move on their behalf. Uh, thank you for being there. And, uh, you know, we don't always get a neon sign, although that would be a great thing. We know you speak in a small voice sometimes. And uh, uh, I thank you that she attributes the answer to you too, Lord. So thank you for the, the uh, response that she needed, a sign for what to do. Pray she still um, uh, seeks you out for things like that, Lord, for her own salvation, for her uh, needs, for her family, and her concerns too, Lord. So, and uh, the first lesson in, in that the Lord might not act in the way we expect. We understand your sovereignty, Lord, and your ability to um, approach in the way we need the best. And uh, thanks for meeting Kim. Kim and I meeting Bert on the road. I was really uh, surprised to say the least, and for a great two weeks we had on the road. Uh, for Carl, we we'll thank, thank you for him and the people who came out and did the work. It's nice to see the hallway with white tile all over. It's pretty cool. And for the general cleanup, we really appreciate that. And for the door work. Thank you for the work yet to be done, and pray you'd help us to work that out too. For Kensington, Lord, we pray for uh, supplies coming in. We thank you for Jenny and her uh, uh, work in, in getting that together. Pray for those who are contributing. Thank you for them. And uh, for the stuff that still needs to be done. And also for David's brother with a new baby. And I pray that that would all go well. And it would be, my mom would be safe, that the birth would be just wonderful, and that uh, you could welcome Mercury into the world. Uh, so thank you for today. Pray for Michael as he preaches. And uh, we're all going looking for uh, people who become the minister here and uh, we thank you for today. Thanks for this worship time and look forward to hearing from your word from Michael for the Lord Jesus name. Amen. Yeah. 
Am I on? There we go. Good morning. We're getting there. It's good to be with you this morning again, as usual. Um, I thank my daughter Marie because I actually have some slides today. <laughs> it's not me. I am not tech savvy. I do not like computers. Um, but my daughters do much better than I do. So. Yeah, um, interesting, you know, maybe like a month ago, Bob asked me to, to schedule this Sunday, you know, to share. And at the time, I was kind of reading through Daniel and, and preparing. And then <laughs> Bob got up the very following Sunday, and he said, please open up to Daniel 1. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, well, that's exactly what I was at the time reading through and preparing for. So you may get a similar message twice, but hmm. the Lord's word, the Lord's word is, is, uh, is useful for us. And uh, So here we go. Um, you probably have heard of the author Francis Schaeffer. I have not read much of his stuff, but he wrote a book that was called uh, How Shall We Then Live? And that's kind of a question I've been wrestling with that's been on my mind. Um, so I just came across it. But in the book he makes this uh, statement. He says, history and culture have a flow, or there is a flow to culture and history. Um, I think it's very true, right? If you think about how the years go by, and then you look back, you see change. Sometimes we look for those good old days, and uh, other times we welcome change. But either way, things shift. Change happens. It's not overnight, but in that day-to-day, -day, like living, I'm not sure we always notice it or that we're really that aware of it. Do you think about it? Do you, are you aware of the flow? Which direction is going? Maybe more importantly, which way are you going? Right? Um, where is our culture? taking us, if we just go with the flow. Have you, probably many of you have seen the, the series Chosen? The Chosen? Have you seen it? A few of you? It begins with um, the, the theme song in it, it begins with these fish that are swimming along, and then, all this, then you see one little fish that's a different color, and it's going the opposite way, right? It's going the opposite direction. That's what comes to my mind, the flow. And then you see some other fish kind of turning around and following this I forget if it's a green fish or something, where all the gray ones are going another way. But, yeah, so what is God doing in our world? And where is our society headed? You know, there are probably important things to think about, to understand the times we're living in. And to be honest, uh, I think the reason I bring this up is because I have concerns. Because I struggle, and sometimes I get uncomfortable with where we're headed. And maybe it's, it's part of that, that sense that Christianity is becoming a smaller and smaller minority in our country. Um, and that's not a newsflash, and yet I kind of feel alarmed at times. And that's particularly because I have five little kids. Not so little anymore, but they're going to see more of the future than I am. And that kind of scares me at times. That makes me <laughs> even more alarmed. And, and I want what's best for them. I want them to be safe. I want them to be comfortable. But I'm not sure those two things actually go together. I'm not so sure being safe and comfortable are, is what is best for them. And so I don't pray for that, even though in my head, my mind is kind of like, I want that for them, but that's not my prayer. And my prayer for them is that they will know when the storms come, they will know the one who can, the only one who can calm the storm. And yeah, that's a, uh, that's, I think, where we're at. Sorry. Um, oops. Not sure. I'm going backwards, but I have to use the slides. <laughs> so, 
This is what Jesus said. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so I kind of wonder why. Why do I wrestle with, or why am I even surprised by troubling times? You know, in this case, maybe more storms that seem to be brewing in the distance. And Jesus simply told us, in this world, you will have trouble. And we can kind of feel like that little white sailboat there, heading into the storm. Perhaps when all the other boats are going the other way. When it seems like, you know, we're the only ones, and why are we headed that way? But Jesus' words are pretty, pretty clear. Um, so I'm not so sure... I'm not so sure that comfortable Christianity is the norm based on what I read in scripture. Um, the Christian life as a safe and comfortable uh, faith is not promised. And yet I kind of expect it in terms of my faith. You know, what I've lived out has been pretty easy and comfortable. And yet we look at Jesus' words He said, you will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Right? It's a long haul. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that I'm going to be hated by everyone. And then, it's not just a one-time thing. It's, this, is, this is a long haul. This is persevering to the end. That sounds a bit more like a marathon to me than a sprint. Again, in the, if the world hates you, Jesus says, keep in mind it hated me first. If you're of the world, the world would love you as its own. If you're not of the world. Right? Um, again, I don't, I don't want to hear that I'm going to be hated. But I'm reminded that if I am for my faith, I, I'm only following in the footsteps of my master, the one I love, and the one who loves me. And, and once more he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. There are, there are many more verses. I deleted some of them because it, you, know, you could go on and on. But just seems pretty clear that the scripture's message is not that we're here in this life to live comfortably. I like the idea, it's just not really what I'm called to, and yet I fight this thing inside of me that says, ah, you know, like water, I want the path of least resistance, I want, to, I, want, I want that. And yet here it's insults, right, false accusations, persecution even. It seems to be kind of more the norm than the other, and in many parts of the world it is. So, you know, I'm living in a somewhat uh, unusual time and place to have had such an easy, easy life. And then sometimes I wonder if it's more because if I, you know, have I stayed caught quiet that much? Because I think there's that aspect to it too. But in this world we will have trouble. He says, take heart. You know, hold on to your faith. Have courage. Stay the course. And so how do we find that courage? Right? in a world that is in increasingly antagonistic for our faith. Can we have courage without hope? I don't think so. You know, can we move forward into the future without the sense that things will work out for the good? No. We have that hope just to have courage. I think they kind of go together. And when Jesus says, I have overcome the world, we have to believe that. We have to trust that and walk in it. There's some verses in the, the book of Jeremiah that I really like, and you, I'm sure, are very familiar with these words. For years, I've kind of held on to these, these words, where Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And they are beautiful words, right? Full of hope. That's kind of how we quote him as well, right? We, we, we share him with each other with the assurance that God's will and desire for you are good. 
So these are the beautiful words that are spoken by God through the prophet Jeremiah to his people in Israel who are in captivity. And I think we kind of miss that part. It's hard to look at one verse in the Bible without context. It's not false to say God's, God's uh, got good plans for you. It's just sometimes we miss context. It's kind of like walking by a puzzle that's in progress. And sometimes you just pick up one puzzle, you kind of look at it, one puzzle piece. Oh, it looks kind of bright, maybe sunshine, maybe it's part of the sunset, and then we put it down and walk away. We never really see how it fits in, unless we sit there and really dig into the puzzle. I think scripture is often like that. But a little bit of quick context, okay, uh, for this verse. It's God's word to the people of Israel who are in captivity. So during Jeremiah's time, he's been called to be a prophet to the nations. Um, a new empire is rising up called Babylon. And it is the power of the world. It's, it's a great empire with one king. His name's Nebuchadnezzar, right? Don't think of a president. Don't think of our president who has many checks and balances by his own government. We're talking about a king who had ultimate power. No one questioned him, right? As humanly as possible, he had all the wealth, the power, and authority that one human could have. He did what he wanted to do. And then he takes his army, he marches down to Israel, and he attacks uh, the capital city, Jerusalem, and eventually burns the temple. And again, don't think of the White House, the Capitol building, because it was so much more than that for the Jewish people. The temple was their core identity, right? It was who they were. It was where God lived among them. And I think so often, you know, when the enemy comes for us, that's what he's after. He's after the very core and identity of who we are, our identity in Christ. So it's in this process, in this context, that Jeremiah speaks to the people. He writes this letter. He's in Jerusalem. He's writing a letter to the exiles who've been carried off to Babylon. And uh, it was the, the, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who had ordered his chief official to, to bring some of these captives, these Jewish captives, back uh, for his service, back to Babylon, the city. Are you with me? <laughs> so, it's, it's uh, one, one caption I read for this passage was disturbing hope. And I thought, it's kind of catchy, it's kind of interesting. Two words that don't really go together, but disturbing hope. Yeah, why, why disturbing? Because being a captive does not seem like a good plan, right? Being dragged off by enemy, by the enemy, with shackles on our feet uh, to a foreign land hardly seems like hope. Because the idea that it was God's purpose to send the captives into exile hardly seemed like prospering. It didn't seem like the kind of future they were looking for. What kind of hope is this, right? But there is a lot more to his message. And this is um, part of what, what he says. We can't read all of it, but I'm going to read through some passages. So just stay with me. This is Jeremiah 29, 4 through 10, if you want to turn there. This is what he writes to the, to the captives in, in uh, Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. Settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. That it plans to prosper you and give you hope in the future, not to harm you. 
That's the context for the verse. He's writing this letter that God has given him. But what he's actually saying is not at all what they're expecting to hear. Right? Settle down. We're talking about settling down in a pagan nation, under a pagan king. Um, yeah, no one wanted to hear that. <laughs> Many of the exiles would have been dead within those 70 years, right? For them, it would have been a message of, we're not coming home. We're not making it back. No one wanted to hear that they had to stay in this foreign land. And they certainly didn't want to hear that they, had, they needed to pray for this land. As the land prospered, they also would prosper. God said that to them. And not to misunderstand the message, the message was not assimilate. It was not become like the Babylonians. But be a light. Be a star. Hold on to your faith in the midst of this season of captivity. In other words, you can do it. You can live as a Christian and survive and make it through the hard times, the trouble that will come. And I feel like, you know, this is us, or at least me, struggling with living my faith in a world that is increasingly hostile to it. And also note that there are competing voices, right, among God's people in Babylon, just as we have competing voices in our world, in our churches today, claiming to know God's word for our times. And Jeremiah's words were not the only ones. In fact, there are many other false prophets that we just read about um, who are speaking in the name of the Lord that the captivity would be over within a matter of a couple of years. And that was much more welcome news, right? Um, yeah, the last thing they wanted to hear was that this thing was going to go on for 70 years. And I can, I can imagine it would have been a little hard for me in their shoes to accept that. But now we zoom into the life of Daniel. Kind of big context, smaller context, one individual here who's, who's actually gone, going through this process. He's been carried off among many, many others, other young men, by the Babylonian king's orders into Babylon. Okay, so now we turn to the book of Daniel to look at what he's going through. Um, notice Daniel and Jeremiah are contemporaries. Right? They actually live there at the same time. They're going through the same troubled times, but in very different places. Jeremiah is still in Jerusalem. Daniel is one of the captives in Babylon. Um, and they're both tasked, really, by God with very specific plans. Like God has, has, has very good plans for both, but they're not easy. Um, so here's Daniel, one of the captives who, who have received, and some believe actually probably was literally the one who would have received that letter that came from Jerusalem to Babylon for the captives, directly for them. So here's Daniel. Um, real quick, through the beginning of his story, uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his official court, the official, uh, court officials, excuse me, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. And among them were... Some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. So here's Daniel and a few others, among probably thousands of others. We're not told what they decided to do or what they didn't do um, or how they went about living out their faith. But you have these four guys here who are now under a pagan king, a pagan kingdom and culture, and they're given a foreign name, 
right? They're living in a foreign land, among, in a foreign culture. They have to learn a foreign language, um, a foreign way of life, and then a foreign diet is imposed on them. And at this point, they kind of do two things. It says they resolved, right? This is what Bob had, had, had talked about. They resolved, they determined, they put their minds to it, or set their minds, um, made their minds up, that they would, one, they would draw a line, and two, they would speak up. They kind of go together, right? If you're gonna draw a line, you're probably gonna have to speak up. But two things that, to me, are pretty significant about this time, the times we live in today. They didn't draw this line, you know, after persecution started. In a sense, like a lot, it gets a lot worse for them as, as under these kings. But I think they had an identity that they held on to in the Lord and the God of Israel, and we have an identity in Christ. And I think if we don't draw the lines, if we're not established where we are now, it will be much harder later. They drew a line. They said, "We won't do this." We're not going past this point. I'm not sure why they drew it there, the dietary laws, but it was for them defiling themselves. It was what God said don't do. They took on the new names, okay. They learned a new language. You know, probably went to the University of Babylon and started learning all this stuff. But at some point, they said, no, we're not crossing this line. They did it very respectfully. And then, as we read right here, God was the one that showed them favor. And I think you can't really overlook that. I've, I'm so thankful that God moves on our behalf in the hearts of people who don't know him. Right? He actually moves on your behalf. He gives you favor with people that don't know him. And on top of that, here he gives these four young men wisdom. He gives them understanding, knowledge. Right? And, and they go through this whole process. And you know the story how the king finds them you know, ten times better than anybody else um, going through the same process. And, you know, it, it's a victory, in a sense, right? They stood their ground, they drew their lines, they spoke up, and it turned out great. The king is incredibly impressed, right? And now they get to serve the king in his courts. And you would think that, or at least I might think and hope, that this is how the story ends, Right? Now they should be comfortable, safe. The king likes them. And that is not at all how it goes. Within the next chapter, I mean, which might be a year or two later, I don't know, but there's a death warrant out for them, literally. In chapter 2, um, the king is sending out men to look for them because he has had a bad dream. So, it's kind of a crazy story. This, this king has had this dream that has disturbed him so much that he has to have an answer for it, but he has to make sure the answer is right, right? He doesn't need people battling and telling him, making stuff up. So in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. And then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we'll interpret it. And the king replies to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces, and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will... Receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. And once more they replied, Let the king tell the service the dream and we'll interpret it. And then, then the king gets furious. He says, I am certain that you're trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. And they go on to, they, come, they try to reason with this guy, but again, he's not our president. This man is, you know, there's no one who can tell him what to do. He's not going to reason with, they're like, this, is, this can't be done. In fact, they attribute it, they say, the only way this can happen is if the gods reveal it. That's the only way. Right? But he's furious. 
uh, and 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men. We're done. You're all, you're all getting hung. Or fired. <laughs> thrown in the fire, whichever, whatever it was. Right? So, interestingly, Daniel and his three friends are among them. They are wise men. They are, um, yeah, part of the, the number of these people that would have been counted with the death penalty. And so, word gets around, and uh, Daniel hears about it, and he immediately goes to the official, Ariok, and he, he asks them about it. What's going on? And, and he's told what's going on, right? And uh, Daniel, interestingly, goes to the king. He says, hey, he, he says the same thing that uh, the others, the astrologers and all said. He says, can you give me some time so that I may interpret it? Interestingly, the king shows him favor. Somehow, Daniel doesn't come across as, no, he doesn't have a clue what he's doing. He's just trying to buy it. No, the king believes him. He says, okay. He seems, you know, he, he does. He gives him time. Daniel goes to his friends. So they're very, they're a tight group. The four of them get together and he says, pray. Pray for God to show mercy. They don't want to die. But there's got to be more to God's plan, right? It must seem senseless at times when we go through trouble. Like, when you don't see the bigger picture, the whole puzzle, it's just, it's hard to understand why. Why we're going through all this stuff. Why... Why the difficulties, Lord? And and as small as our world seems to be compared to the big news going on, like, you know, I think of me being in Lansdale and my neighbors, I'm not anywhere near the new, the front cover. Lansdale's, what's Lansdale? PA, US. You know, the big news is always somewhere else. And I thought, you know, reading through this even historically, Israel on the map is very tiny. This isn't... Headline news, Babylon taking over Israel, Jerusalem getting you know, conquered, temple being burned. From what I hear, and I'm not a historian, but um, Babylon really was at odds with Egypt. And they needed to get to the Mediterranean to protect their trade routes. And they didn't want Egypt to get up there. And the way through there was partly through Jerusalem, through Israel. right? And yet what God is doing in time and history is right here. And so... In some ways, I think we can be encouraged when we look at our situations, and sometimes it's troubling, and we think, hey, you know, why? It's because God is actually doing that work right here in this town, in this place, in this time that might seem so insignificant in this church and world world. So they get together, they pray, they ask God for mercy, and God gives them the dream. He gives them a dream that someone, can you imagine, Kim, if you had gone to like the hotel, whatever, and been like, I had a dream, it was really bad, tell me what it was. Well, I did tell her the dream. You told her the dream, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, the very thing that the, the king asked was obviously crazy. But it didn't scare Daniel, not in the same way as it did the astrologers, because he knows the God, the, the one who, the, the great revealer. And God gives him the dream, Daniel goes back to the king. This is Daniel chapter 2, continues, verse 36. This was the dream. I'm going to read the part that's the interpretation. He gives him the dream first, confirming to the king that God can do this, which by this point, I would think the king, I mean, he is blown away. How do you do that? You can't, unless, you know, the God who can do this. So now he's going to give him the interpretation with it. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. 
And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown you the king, has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. You've probably seen images, if you've read this passage in the Bible, the Bible might even have an image of this statue, right? Um, what it looked like. And uh, the, the different sections of it, right? But in, in this case, the head is the gold, and you have the silver, you have the bronze, you have the clay, and the iron mixed. Um, the king's amazed, total miracle. Daniel interprets it for him. Again, what a great ending, right? Like for Daniel, this should be, this is awesome. The king is incredibly impressed. He's going to shower him with gifts and all the other things he said, promotions. And if it were to end here, great, good story. And no, it doesn't. It's like, no, in this world you'll have trouble. But take heart. And I overcome the world. <laughs> when you read on in Daniel, it kind of seems like the king checked out at verse 38. Right? I don't know that he heard the rest of the dream. That's when Daniel goes, you, O king, are the head of gold. <laughs> okay. I like that. That like Nebuchadnezzar says. You know, and maybe it wasn't as bad a dream as I thought. Because he didn't know if he was the getting crushed by... Well, yeah, I don't know what all he makes of it. But pretty odd, and really, in a sense that... He never asked about the most important or the most amazing part of the dream, the most mysterious part of the dream. He just heard, you're the head of gold, it would seem. You know, he's the head and he's the gold. That's great. But what about the rock? What about this mysterious kingdom and this rock that crushes every other kingdom? The king is personally given an amazing peek into the future, and that future actually has a picture of the eternal kingdom. One that's actually going to be eternal, not like his. Right? His is being passed on. And he gets that picture, at least he's given it, that another kingdom will come. Then another kingdom. But eventually, a rock is going to come and smash them. And the God of heaven will set up an eternal kingdom. All he heard was, you know, like, oh. he didn't seek the rock or his kingdom. And I think a lot of times that's the world we're living in. And I think that's what I can kind of find discouraging. At times... I want to be able to speak truth and share and be faithful. And then I want to see results. I want to see people turn to the Lord, or at least at least ask about this kingdom. And that doesn't always happen. This is just a quick story of, at, toward the end of the school year. Um, Rachel found out that one, one of the teachers uh, at the school was teaching something that you know we don't agree with, and we weren't told about it. Normally they, they send a note home and tell you they're going to... So Rachel called, um, and she you know, wrote a very respectful letter to the school, to you know, the teacher, and the principal, and so, so on. But, um, and then they responded. They said, okay, we'd love to talk to you. Come on in. Rachel did all her homework. I think she was one, far more informed, but very respectful, I, you know, the way she went about the letter and what she shared with them. I remember talking to her on the phone that day, when she got back, and I just said, you know, how'd it go? And she said, it was disappointing. And that, that kind of hit me. I think that's the feeling I get here. Disappointing because when you share something with somebody, you're hoping for that change. Somehow, like a light bulb goes off, right? You share truth, someone's gonna respond. And that's not always the case. It doesn't mean God's not working. But we are living in the times of the Gentiles, as Jesus says. And not everybody responds. And in this case, you know, I think, Nebuchadnezzar, you missed it. Look at the dream God gave you. You know, you read on a little bit further and it just gets worse. The reason I go, I lost my picture. Yeah. My computer went to sleep. Now the TV went to sleep. That's okay. 
That's okay, dude. Um, yeah, so, yeah, you, if, if we read on, if we did you know, chapter three, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? <laughs> Builds a statue, a very big statue of gold. <laughs> the whole statue is gold. Many think maybe the reason he did this was because he didn't really like the rest of it. He wanted to just stay gold, right? Forget the silver and the bronze and all these other kingdoms that are supposed to come on. He's out of gold, I'll make it all out of gold. So, and, and does it get better for the but You know, Daniel and his friends, they actually end up in the furnace, in the fire, because they will not bow to this very image that Nebuchadnezzar comes up with. Their lives don't ever really seem to get comfortable. I guess that's what I'm wrestling with. This, this world is not my home. And Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Why do I think mine should get comfortable? And what I take away is, I guess, you know, I need to stop thinking that I'm going to somehow be rewarded with comfort or safety in this life. Whether I do what's right or wrong, but if I do right especially, that I somehow deserve a more comfortable life. I'm not promised it. I'm certainly not guaranteed it. But I do believe as we seek God together with all our hearts, we will know his good plans and purposes for our lives. Um, that he doesn't have plans to harm us, but to give us a hope and a future. So I'll leave you with these words, maybe like a benediction, from Philippians chapter 2. Um, there, I feel like I could put Daniel right into the midst of these verses, and they, they describe him and his friends well. But hopefully it will be an encouragement to us too. That God has purposes, us, purposes for us in these storms, stormy times, whatever they may look like. Therefore, my dear, brother, dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. That was the last slide. Mm -hmm. But um, just a picture of the fact that, you know, we're, that's what we're called to. There might be storms, but the heavens are huge, and those stars are lights. And that's what God's purpose for us is, that we would shine, come what may. Lord bless. Are we moving right into the discourse? Can we do that? Okay. I don't know if you're going to talk about it later, but what we're always amazed maybe about the end of that section is that... Uh, the most powerful person in the world whose testimony is the power of God, because he was supposed to be God. And the fact that all the other uh, smart guys in the kingdom were spared because of Daniel's revelation. Yeah. You know? I mean, I mean that's I mean you hear about uh, uh, damage, uh, collateral damage. This is collateral goodness. You know, yeah. they really were spared. Because one man spent that yeah, and trust that man. Yeah. And that's really good. Um, next week, I hope to look, continue in Daniel to another dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. So we'll go from there. If we want to get into groups, then we can do that. Maybe four groups. That might work. And I do have a few questions we can look at. But um, it's also, I remember when we started this course groups, there wasn't so much questions hang, uh, handed out as much as like, feel free to kind of engage what's been shared. So this isn't like a strict outline, you know, share what's on your heart. You know. okay. Why don't we do four groups kind of in this area and uh, we'll go from there.